with a little bit of mix of petite genre. So, Marcela is going to be our guest artist owner to have you. So, well, I will start. Some of the great still life contains complex messages. The narrative encapsulated in the type of object displayed and how they arrange. Thus, when studying a still life composition, be aware that the items displayed might be symbols, symbols infusing the picture with, a symbol, with symbolic significance. For example, in the Vanitas painting, this form of Christian art was refined by the Dutch, art, uh, Dutch relief artist as a reaction against Roman Catholic Church and to meet the new austere aesthetic of Protestant Reformation art. So we're always going to find the skull in the Vanitas. The constant characteristic theme of Vanitas painting is that nothing matters. God will kill you anyway. So no matter how much you learn or how many achievements you get in the life, you know, we all die at the end. So I think this is why they also portray all the objects in a messy way because there are no hierarchies. Like it's all ending in the same. So the flowers, the flowers will wilt, the fruit will rot, and no power or abundance can save us. Even the accomplishment of science and arts and literature, music have no lasting existence. Neither, yeah, this is like. Everything you can know about the world. So, for example, here you can find a little skull. And there is always this comparison. Comparison. For example, here you can find the butterflies. So, the artist is making this metaphor that science and history is it's going to disappear you know, as butterflies, too. Ironically, Vanitas paintings were themselves examples of valuable goods and become Vanitas ob objects themselves because only rich people can have this painting would make everything highly cynical. So let's imagine the famines. Let's think about that time. This is like 13th century when the Inquisition was created until the 17th century. Now these paintings don't look scary to us, but imagine the visual power of this representation. Uh, they have a high level of repressive moral. So another element that we can find in these paintings is the like the fruit, like the lemon. It looks like a big coding at the time. So, but we can also check how they portray ideologies naturalized in our society. Sorry. And I wanted to show this comparison of the lobster with the painting and this is culture from Lynn My Seed. So I want to share this artist that I admire because she also worked with animal rights. So we can see in this portrait of the food, also the animal uh, being represented as objects. And I like, well, she works with metal painting and material. And here is an example of the opposite view of the Vanitas, you know, animal liberation. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if we see like these two animals in the, the Vanitas paintings, they, they are food. 
here the free. And also I wanted to make a little note because I know your comment. Well, yes, I'm proud to all the quality in the farm industry. Thank you. <laughs> so going back to the academic, uh, there is also a social connection between animals, food, flowers, with the domestic and also the representation of women, of female characters. So this one is the well-stocked kitchen with Jesus in the house of Martha and Mary in the background. So this is Jesus. And like also Jesus portrayed as the promise of you know happiness and food. Again, let's imagine that time. So another example on how contemporary artists retain the characteristic of this genre, this is from a feminist point of view, uh, and also vegan, <laughs> all because they're so, yeah. so we have this Argentinian artist that I like very much too. This installation is called Self-Management of Love. And we can find the same items in the contemporary parallel, you know, like the cleaning products, food, flowers, and also this Baroque style. <coughs> oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And I, I also like this example of how the genre is very theatrical. Even though this is an installation and it's more like a concept of expanded painting. So another Argentinian artist that I want to talk also in the last session of geometry is Cristina Chiavi because she does this uh, like geometry uh, for interpretation of domestic environments too. So this is the opposite. But one of her installations was called Mercado, and she also referred to food in a very graphic way. And also working with other artists with different techniques of, that we can think of them like decorative techniques, like the Venecitas. And this is the carpet. A watermelon. Mm -hmm. Another artist <coughs> that I think we call in the she called this bodega art. But Lucia Yarro made this bags of <coughs> what you can relate to also in like Latino <laughs> shopping. <laughs> you know, like butter, uh, big vaporu. <laughs> <laughs> And I think it's, it's a nice example to think also how Vanitas use a lot of Western icons that can be refrained you know, from other cultures. Western European. This one is from Archivo de la Memoria Trans. It's an archive made by trans women. I, I already talked about them. And I love this picture because it also makes me think about the genre of the domestic, but how it changed when we think of those environments about different bodies. So, because Vanitas represent cis women, how change the, the narrative when it's a trans woman but also represented by a trans woman. So another artist is Lucia Reisi from Argentina and she cleaned houses and she used also her work to produce art. So that's the rack she used to clean or 
to take pictures of the houses you clean. And I like this one especially because it's also the flowers and we can relate it to the genre, but with the money, like she got paid from cleaning. <laughs> so because a lot of people is like, oh, okay, I leave the money in the flowers. And also the petite genre with the domestic has this representation of woman and a servant. And I want to go back to the domestic also because the hierarchy of genres at the time, like still life and petite genre was the lowest category. I think it, did, it was because they were related to the quality and the feminine. domestic labor. But for me it's important to remark that again, which hand was the key factor of the division of social roles by gender. So before that we can find women who were constructor, carpenter. Before, but again, I recommend to read Silvia Federici, uh, The Caliban and the Witch. Uh, I think it, I mean, personally, it blew my mind, you know, how the, the witch hand is also related with uh, the origin of capitalism. Um, one common definition of genre scene of the petite genre is that it shows figures to one to whom no identity can be attached either either individually or collectively. So these are not persons like these are not the persons uh, for the one that paid them. So. And to finish, this is why I think the work of Lucia is very important. For example. Uh, just to make a note, like it's important to see the stories from the protagonist and not from the people that represent them from a privileged position of power. Oh so yeah, that's my suggestion. Like, look out for the people that uh, is the protagonist of the narrative, not the ones that represent. So mm -hmm. now I'm gonna. It is one of those genres that has been like pushed to the side 
And I was thinking about other ones, and I was like, I also felt very strongly about landscape. You know, I was like, I want to so into it. Um, but then I started thinking about why I was more into like portraiture or something like that. And I was like, well, there's like human element, and there's to it. Um, but in the still life, there's something that's so like anthropomorphic about an object. It's not like an object you see it, and it can be something for itself, but when you're you're like reading a meaning out of it. Um, and the other thing about like the still life or like something like that is that you don't actually have to you know have the thing to paint the thing. You can like make something else out of it. You don't need like it becomes about representation and about imagination and about like you know props and theater and things like that. Way. And that's kind of like how I started thinking about the genre and like my own use of uh, props and sets for the photographs that I make. Um, and also just the playfulness that you can ask you know, something to act like something else. Um, and at the same time, this allowing us to like tell the stories that we actually want to tell without that um, life actually existing right now. Right? So we, we have the possibility of imagining something better or something alternative without that actually existing yet. And so when I was also thinking about this genre, um, there's also like this playfulness about it, of, you know, something I can something else that like, is like convincing um, and good because it really just gets you into like a different world. Um, and all this to say that like, um, you know, I was, I, both of my parents do a lot of theater, so I grew up around like a lot of people, you know, that were like mine in my living room hanging out or just like random things <laughs> happening that were like part of like my daily life which felt very special looking back. Um, but also, you know, they were doing a lot of theater in the 90s in Colombia where like everything was kind of shitty and I was like so confused. I was like, people are getting killed, but there's like mobs in my living room, what's happening? It was very confusing. But also like looking at my parents as people who are using theater as a way of like creating their own world despite all the circumstances that they were living in. Yeah, so thank you. So one of the things that I was thinking about was how, um, you know, I didn't want this this presentation to be only about my work because I was like, ah, you know, it's, it's about a genre I want so many people that like we don't know about, um, and I also just as an opportunity to like nerd out on um, looking at art, which I love. <laughs> um, and I found this person, and you know, I was thinking about the connection between an object and text and like where it takes you, and so she did this. Um, this series of works where that, co that are called Foley objects. So this is like the object sound is what it represents down below. So in a way you're like imagining the sound of the photograph as you're looking at it. Um, and she has this, would you show the next one? Um, and as, you said, as you're looking at this like, you know, exhibition full of all of these works, you're like start to hear all these sounds at the same time. And there's like this participation of the viewer that's so, fundamental to like making the, the works come to life. And so one of the other things that you know I was reading about looking at like the history of still life was that you know it was like there's like all these things in like Flemish painting and People were, you know, were also thinking about how, like in Egyptian tombs, there were like all these depictions of like um, the food that you would give to the dead once they, like, you know, once you put them in the tombs and stuff like that. And also like the difference between how the Spaniards were doing like bodegones, um, where it wasn't about austerity, but it was about like a, like the modesty of life. And then there was like the prong still life that was about like like wealth and like just like excess. Um, and one of the cool things that I was thinking about was how like, you know, the Spanish would rather do like um, a depiction of like a dead animal before doing like cooked meat. And just like they, how the object is actually moving and like transforming and what that transformation looks like. Um, this is uh, work by Lara Rocas, who's a Canadian artist who lives here in the Bay Area. Um, and I think she's playing. She's playing with the physicality of like the different objects. So like, she makes the hand made out of cardboard, and then she paints out of you know she paints that hand, and then the hand is painted into like another painting of a rose, 
And then she was, she was like showing it. So it's like this like multiple <coughs> classes in which these objects are interacting with each other at the same time. And it's just like, you know, super trippy, but also like really visually striking. You know, they have one of their hands in the back. <coughs> Um, yeah, so we have this Sorry. one. No, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so this is like a ceramic of the cardboard block, you know, hand that she's painted before. And, and it's just like, I think she plays with a lot of tropes about like femininity and like um, women in sports and kind of like, you know, equity in women in sports, which is, should be another genre. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what this is? It's probably a playful. <laughs> I like them. Yeah, and this is another example. So. <laughs> yeah. so, I also want to show you a little bit of my work, and this is like older work. It feels old now. Um, but I, I was looking at all those like you know Flemish paintings where there's like all these weird portraits. We're looking three quarters of the way, and there's like spooky lighting and. And I always wonder, like, what's outside of that window? Like, why don't they want to show us the rest of the thing? <laughs> like, I don't care about that face so much. Um, so I wanted to just create a little bit of a series that was about, like, you know, expanding the frame beyond what we um, label as such. And, and I asked people to just, like, bring objects to my studio. And I was like, yeah, perfect colors is fine. And so seeing, like, what people were bringing and then telling me what each one of the things meant. And then you start reading kind of like a, your own story about the, the photograph. Let me show you one. This one's part of the same, um, the same series. And then, you know, in the books, there's like the undercover surrealist, which now feels like a little bit too straightforward. But <laughs> <laughs> there's like a William Eggleston like, photo of the woman sleeping. And now I feel very whatever about William Eggleston. But then, you know, you have like all these comparisons of like different media, of, like the film or like VHS and like the frame, and all those existing together in this uh, kind of like messy way. And one of the cool things that I really liked about still life was that, you know, beyond you reading whatever you want to read of an object, there's also, there were, you know, for like early Christians being like really afraid of persecution, there was like all this elements where each one of them signified something else, right? So like, I don't know, like, the rose was like the Virgin Mary, or like the lily was like justice and like uh, virginity, or like the pomegranate was the church, which I didn't know, and I was like, oh, that's weird. <laughs> um, you know, the sunflower was like sun and devotion, and so there's like all this other intertextual language that is happening in like visual culture that we might not necessarily be aware of, but that was just like so ingrained into like, we're gonna convert you all through these paintings. <laughs> Subliminal propaganda. So while I was making these works, I was also looking at, um, you know, people who have been working with like monochromatic works. And this is Sophie Kahl, who was kind of pretending to be a fictional character, um, and created kind of like this diet. So for each day, she would eat different things. And you know, there, there's this thing about um, materializing ideas in the world that I think is very beautiful about this, where you're, you're just like. Well, I'm gonna like be this fictional character, and the way this character eats is this way, and I'm actually gonna like make it happen. Um, and they'll, and just kind of like having that like become part of our daily life, and like our rethinking of what we eat every day, and like how we do it. How do we engage in like really mundane activities, and can you make that more magical? And if so, like, do you do? And like, you know, just thinking about those things. I also want to show this works by Sarah Sunar, where below all of this, there's like a um, like a poster of an actual bouquet, like a, of a painting of a bouquet, mm. and then she like starts organizing all these objects to like kind of match it up um, as a, as like a kind of like a contemporary flower arrangement, which I think you know, just like this. There's like two more of those. And it's cool that you can kind of see like the you know the writing from the last uh, piece of like the last image. It's like appropriation in a different way. Um, 
So this is Stephanie Sikuku, who is also based in the Bay, and I like love her work. Um, and this is part of like the neutral orchids, where she like trained all these orchids and into like this neutral, like seamless backdrop. And in a way, it's just like denying the like liveliness of these uh, plants, right? Like they're alive, but they become like dead nature or like naturaleza muerta, which is what we also call it. Um, but then they, they remain alive for a couple, you know, for some days after, and so some of them still bloom, mm -hmm. even after being painted. If you want to show the next one. Also, the Yeah, so then it kind of like, you know, it becomes this like very, um, I don't know, like strange way of existing in a neutral world where like, it's actually like a sense of resistance almost. Mm -hmm. you know, like, and um, the, you know, this whole idea of like, I don't know, uh, controlling nature and to what point does it become, um, you know, counterintuitive. This is like another example from Sandy Scotland. This always uh, makes me think about the Midwest. <laughs> um, just, you know, I live there, so it's not like I'm just chilling on the Midwest. <laughs> uh, but, you know, just kind of retaking those elements and making it into something else and thinking about graphic design and um, this idea of like pain painting with live objects in a way and using that like flattening of space that like happens in photography, um, which I think is sort of like magical elements about the medium where you're like, we're in a three-dimensional space, we take a picture, it becomes dimensional, and then you like make it three-dimensional again. So after like all the um, series with like a lot of objects, I was like, maybe I can just like simplify it a little bit. And use one object instead and try to make the image, you know, kind of question the functionality of an object or like transform the like anthropomorphic, like nature uh, of like the subject into something else. And also start to like, um, to alter the subjects and, you know, kind of um, question like the movement of an object or like what it can symbolize and, and thinking so much about like stock markets or like heartbeats um, and the way you like. And all of this, you know, is just taking all of those elements that we're all used to seeing perform in such a way and just kind of like giving them a different role in this stage. And like trying to play around with the idea of like when, which bodies are forgiven for what and you know, how they move into the world. Um, yeah, I was reading this text and I was like, you know, kind of thinking about how that anthropomorphic nature of an object gives all of us the, the ability to read a work so differently and so, you know, becoming of like, so depending on our, our mood or like, uh, you know, what kind of day we're having or like what situation you're living at the moment. In a way where it's not like, you know, when I was using a lot of subjects in my work, it, the reading of the work became about like, you know, Who's that person? What are they doing? Like, oh, or I know that person, they're like this and this. And I was really interested in how do you talk about identity politics without the body being there? Um, or perhaps asking the body that is viewing like about their own body and their own assumptions of the body. And and also thinking, you know, thinking about like um, yeah, just kind of how we're expecting objects to behave in the way in the same way that we're expecting bodies to behave. Right. There's like a trajectory that they're like supposed to follow and we're all supposed to follow that that are that is completely arbitrary that like we never asked for and try to think of you know beyond those things, which I you know there are so many other ways of doing one thing, so and when I was doing this kind of work it was also like how do you give a, a personality to a personality to a, to an object and make that inter interaction between an object and a human a little bit more uh, I mean, more human, but also just kind of creating those tensions that perhaps could be more poetic or more allegorical in a way. And with this one, I was thinking so much about, like, I went to a school that didn't have a uniform in Colombia, which was like, it was like a very radical thing. 
And some people were like, oh, you, you go to that school. <laughs> and, and it wasn't even like a celebrated thing. It was like, you guys don't know how to dress. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the thing about school that, and like uniforms and this way that we think about trajectories is that you know, you're like supposed to follow this thing, even though your bodies are different and all the things. And I was actually thinking about the pencils, and I remember being like, you know, whenever you get the list of supplies when you first day of school, it's like, those at your way, you know, it's like two inch mm -hmm. pencils, like, and, and, you know, I had like all these other pencils because I like to draw, and I would be like, oh, I'm going to use a 6B or whatever, and they're like, this is too dark, or like, oh, like I can't read it, or like, too light, and I was just like, this is so stupid, like, how does, like, this ideology, you know, transform into like the pencil that we're writing with, and like, why don't we have those options for having whatever you want to? Um, and like, also think about labeling through something, and like, obviously, I'm thinking about this with like gender or like the ways we live life and how we exist within that. But like, for me, it's so much more exciting to see it in like the smallest gestures and be like, this is so like crazy. We're like controlled to like the pencil we use. Um, this is one of my favorite pieces ever, and it's so simple and it's utilizing, you know, like some object that already exists in the world, in the world, and Felix Gonzalez Torres is like, you know, does this piece um, to talk about his dying lover who has AIDS, and there's this beautiful thing about the clocks, you know, performing together, just like running off arbitrary time. And then that like at one point one of the clocks is gonna stop before the other one. And it's like how do you make the most poetic thing out of something so like you know visually they share or something? I also love this series. Um, this is like a series by Tammy Ray Carlin, who also lives in the Bay, um, and was doing all the series about like lesbian beds, and there's like this projection of the body, like they're not there and you're you know, I'm thinking like, oh, why did you choose that type of sheets? Like, those are so weird. Or like, you know, you're like thinking about that. And again, it almost becomes more political to see the object than to become to see the bodies that would be there otherwise. I'm so bright. But um, so you know, I was trying to think about how do you take like a complex idea and make it into something like. Um, simpler visually and this is like a, one of those like post-it pads that are like creative in massive production that like a lot of comedians use um, and but like you know the, the distance between the lines is always the same is something you can expect and was kind of changing that and giving this line like a character positionality almost. And as I was thinking about all this, I was also thinking about, you know, photography is super uptight and, you know, has all these rules and they're like, you know, hanging at this height and all these things and, um, and uh, you know, and it's also like a very expensive medium, so I was like really interested in like building my own frames and starting to just like make the, the frame itself like an object with a personality, that could be a thing. Um, and also playing with those senses of like three-dimensionality as so you take a photograph of something that's just like on the wall. Um, so this is a picture of a map board. And you know, this is, this is a very weird material. Um, it's very expensive and you know, it has that function of like, uh, kind of like showing off the photograph so that it is more archival and whatnot. And I was doing a project and I realized that in Mexico they call the mat or the Maria Luisa. And I was just like, that's so ah. fucked up. Like, put like a woman's name into the thing that's just been like, I'm showing off my partner in the photograph. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, that's how I feel. <laughs> and, and I was like, well, maybe I can make the, the Maria Luisa have her own that adventure for once. So, like, be the, the subject matter of the work. And this was like super nerdy me being like, fuck photography, this is so dumb. Um, but also like super nerdy because I feel like photographers said like, aha, and other people are like, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it so it, it was more of an exercise to be like, what can you make with just one type of material and, and let that material be like its own diva in its own <laughs> universe. 
Um, and for this one, I started painting in the wall also, so that you know it would kind of create that light layering of two-dimensional, three-dimensional space. And it's funny because the only way you can tell that material is that material is with like, that 45 degree angle in this thing, um, which they can very nerdy. These are pictures of the 3D. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, this was part of a different series uh, that was called Slow Clap, like in the middle of um, you know election times or whatever, and I was just like. Nothing behaves like anything. We cannot expect anything out of um, the, the systems. Like you know, the, the fire could be crumbled and it would be a fine thing. And thinking about materiality and objects behaving differently, or like celebrating the erroneous, which is kind of like how I would see that that kind of like still life of you know, this I believe those who are like always being pushed to the side and. Um, and like with fire, I was thinking so much about it because it was such a like destructive force, but but it also gives us so much, and th there is something so untamable about it. And from this piece, the next uh, series came off, and for this, I was taking um, you know like polygons or like still lives from the uh, from Fernando Montero, who's like this Colombian painter who's kind of like the national voice of Colombian <laughs> artists. And um, I mean, he was doing, you know, he has like his interesting song or whatever, but it's also super cliche. And I'm like, there's so many more artists, can we please move on? <laughs> and, but what he was doing with some of the stuff was that he was taking the like more like Eurocentric genre and then trying to like put more elements that were more like autochthonous, which is not true in this one, because water now is not, but whatever. Um, and so I was trying to like, kind of remove each one of the objects and make it its own fire. Uh, there, there's all, like, all these images of like combustions and like explosions and things were just like happening and I was just like feeling like, oh my god, everything's fucking crazy. And like trying to continue, it was kind of like an exercise, but also like burning both of those paintings. So I was like, <laughs> um, and leaving just like one element that would like, you know, kind of like wake at you up and like, this used to be a thing no more. Yeah. And yeah, this uh, idea of like the still fire, which is kind of how I started thinking about it. So this is just so you see it more. And I really hope he gets to see it once. <laughs> 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 like, dear <laughs> And this one, you know, also still goes like, it's fire in the painting already. <laughs> Sunsets from like um, I was gonna say Tinder, <laughs> from Flickr, it's just like all this, you know, put, putting them all together and kind of changing that that meaning of what a sunset can be is like how do you capture the inexpressible of the inexpressible nature of the sunset and then if you put all of this together it becomes something else but in a way it's like the the like collective depiction of what this could be like. Um, and I, I really like, you know, I already really like this work, but I was thinking about how much I liked it even more as a, as a still life. Like, like, what if it was, you know, this was a representation of something else? And also thinking about how, like, one image doesn't always represent something, but you have, like, this plurality of meanings and, like, uh, visual culture. I just wanted to show this one because. <laughs> It's like a very weird story where my friend kept getting all these credit card offers and they all looked like this was what the envelope looked like. <laughs> and I was just like, well, you're 
already have like a hundred thousand dollars in debt, like why are they showing you in paradise? Which is like this tropical paradise also. Uh, it's like very colonial, like, like yeah. here, you can be a colonizer again. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have the money to, but you do try. <laughs> um, so this, the American dream, you know, the tropics, but... Um, and, you know, when I was doing the still fires, I was thinking so much about that texture of like, what is a monochromatic texture that, that is not monochromatic, that is not like color based, but it's like texture based. And I started doing this work about like kinship and kinship through a material. So like it can be like through leather or like through denim, like what kind of kin does that create? Um, what are symbols of belonging with each other? And also thinking about like family, a family that's not like through blood, but a family that is messy and horizontal and like sexy sometimes and like um, ugly at times also. Um, and I was showing this work and for the first time like earlier this year, and earlier this year, and someone was like, "Hey, I, I just texted, and you sexted your work to someone," and I was like, "That's not I've ever known." <laughs> Or just think, you know, I brought this very cliche book, which you 
people can see and laugh at or <laughs> inspired by my house in the library and it's like this is too bad. And it like gives you all that, you know, like if you were to have a proper class, not like this one. <laughs> like all the propositions that I mean, you know, proper. And um I forgot what I was gonna say. Oh yeah, there's like this whole side about like composition that's very like do the objects, is a tension and, and I don't have to put this one up just because it, it just anti-composition anti and it's like this, you know, it's like so much more interesting in a way. Um I I've worked with students with like younger people before and they're always like, please tell me the tricks of composition. And I'm like, I don't know, I'm just making your own oh, like I can tell you the rules. But like that's just not even, you know that's not gonna make it necessarily. Um, I was trying to show them some of these works that are just like outside of what we're expecting to see. Um, and this um, work is really incredible. But I was like looking at a couple of them where they have like a flower arrangement and then they explode them and then they take the picture. So still thinking about movement and stillness and and disruption and what you were talking about like. Uh, you know, Bunny does be in this genre that like talks about the meaning meaninglessness of life and the inevitability of death. Um, and with movement, you know, with thinking about movement in my work, one of the things that like took me to like start building this type of frames where where that like you know when you think about a photo, you think about a still image. When you think about a movie, you think about a moving image, and like all of those frames in between kind of give that space for that narrative to build onto. Um, so having two images in one image, I'm always like, yes. Like, it, it just gives like a little sense of like a bigger sense of space. And then I just want to quickly talk about um, this body of work which I just finished and I'm very really stoked about because it, you know, I was like looking at all these journals in the San Francisco Public Library and GLBT Historical Society and I was kind of like going through like queer bodies that existed in the past and like, you know, asking them to participate in this thing by like, um, kind of like scanning the image and printing it life size and, and then like having it interact with someone from the present. And I was thinking about it, especially for this um, talk, in the sense that, like, um, you know, the way we look at history and like history of art is so like, um, it's like not neutral. Obviously, there's like this way that it has been taught to us, right? In the same way that, like, I think, you know, the feminist school of painting. I was like, yes, like, all of my art teachers, especially in Indiana, were like super uptight about what something could be. Um, and like what history could be and like seeing yourself represented and all those things that like you know we always talk about but um, when thinking about like queer legacy and like archives there's this sense of like you know the past and the present and the future but everything is always kind of like how do we link that more and how do we celebrate those bodies that came before us and how do we like uplift each other to like create like a different um, more needed future in a way. So here you can see kind of like the you know the two bodies interacting um, together. This is about like kind of like impossible kinship through decades, through different decades, and and still thinking about those like meaning, um, these like symbolic gestures of like aesthetic gestures of like the mustache of what does that person would they have something in common? What kind of um, legacy do they share with each other? And when we were doing all these photo shoots. Um, you know, I was like telling the, my friends and people that were helping me, I was like, hold them like they're, they're a real body, you know, you have to interact them tenderly and like, <laughs> playfully, like hold them like a lover. And it was like this whole thing of interacting with a still object that was also representing something bigger than that. And at the same time, kind of calling the attention to, you know, the Xerox quality, the black and white, and the, how the image making process has changed over this period of time. And again, what you were talking about, you know, it's kind of 
what are the alternative paths that we make to ourselves and it's like allowing all those bodies that um, that existing to like thrive uh, rather than to you know to like conceal them or pretend they don't exist at all. And putting like all this narrative in like one bigger frame. And then I, this is kind of how the, the installation looks like. And in a way, I always think about all of these things, all these characters, like each one, each piece is like a bigger character, and then they all come together again in the installation and become like they have a sense of movement through the painting that, that, that some of them have. And I just want to finish with this, um, with, uh, which is this last battle, which is like, it's like a good friend uh, who's also a performer, but you know, as we were thinking about like flower arrangements and bouquets, and like, this is someone who is like currently transitioning and thinking about, you know, like um, the change of like time and like the change of bodies, and also like what, how do you represent bodies and those movements in like less, in like more fragmented pictures rather than that, like, you know, in the picture we can see someone clearly transitioning or clearly going through something and rather than just like, just leaving space for people to see it a little bit more. So that's all, that's all I got. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.